Hello and welcome to episode 37 of the 905er podcast. My name is Roland Tanner. I am Joel McLeod. And we'll start off today with a quick reminder about supporting the 905er through Patreon. Joel and I are doing this podcast for the love of it, uh, but also because we think it's important that our region has a media outlet that doesn't treat the millions of people who live in our cities as an afterthought. But we want to see the 905er grow into something bigger than just the two of us. We want to be able to pay for professional coverage, to spend the time needed to cover stories unique to our region with the level of detail they deserve. You can only do that with your help. Please consider becoming a monthly donor to the 905er via Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the 905er. We're happy to say that Patreon has recently begun accepting Canadian dollars as a currency and we'll also be offering annual subscriptions as an alternative to monthly payments plus additional levels of support in the weeks ahead. And yes, we're also planning on offering awards to everybody who supports us. Watch this space. Our interview today picks up on an important story that is affecting thousands of Ontarians, but which has attracted relatively little attention, and that mainly on how it's affecting people in Toronto. Early in the COVID crisis, the province suspended all evictions and eviction proceedings. That moratorium ended in the summer. Since then, the Landlord and Tenant Board has gotten back to work with gusto and has been processing large numbers of evictions via video call, regardless of the spread of COVID or the precarious financial circumstances many Ontarians are facing themselves in at the moment. To speak more about this issue, which applies to renters across the 905 region, we're speaking today with Alyssa Briley, Executive Director and General Counsel at the Centre for Equality, Rights and Accommodation. Alyssa is a 905er herself and grew up in Burlington before training as a lawyer and standing as a candidate at the 2011 federal election. She then worked as Health, Social, Justice and Labour Policy Advisor to the President of the Treasury Board of Ontario and as the Director of Policy to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure prior to 2018. As Executive Director of CIRA, Alyssa leads an organisation that both advocates for legal reform in housing and also provides services and advice to people facing eviction. Hey, well, uh, welcome, Alyssa Briley, to the 9 to 5 podcast. Um, really glad to have you on today. Uh, just in the interest of just full disclosure, Alyssa is, is definitely someone who I, I count as a friend, and Joel and I have both known her for probably getting on for 10 years or so um, uh, because of our, our political involvement in the past. And Alyssa was, was a, a candidate for the uh, federal Liberal Party of Canada back in, back in the day, but is now uh, working at the... Uh, uh, Centre for Equality Rights. Um, so, Alyssa, I wonder if you could just sort of kick us off um, by kind of giving us the background to this story um, uh, that, you know, obviously with um, COVID, many of us have been under the impression that, that uh, the, the government was kind of saying, you know, don't be kicking people out um, of their homes during COVID. And yet, it appears that something very different has been happening. I wonder if you could just give us the uh, the, the background to that story. Sure, and uh, thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, it's great to it's great to to be here. Um, so, in terms of uh, maybe maybe it makes sense to sort of start back at the beginning of the pandemic because I think part of what you said is right insofar as the government at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, took some action to make sure that nobody was losing their home. So uh, you may recall back in March, there was a province-wide moratorium put on evictions, uh, residential evictions. Um, and that there were sort of two pieces to that moratorium. Uh, one was the moratorium on enforcing the orders themselves that came out of the process that everyone has to go through uh, if they are going to be evicted uh, at the landlord tenant board. And the other part of the moratorium was the suspension of all activity um, with, with a few minor exceptions um, at the landlord tenant board itself. So existing orders could not be enforced and no new orders uh, could be sought. And that was as, uh, as of March 19th. And that stayed throughout most of the summer as we had the state of emergency uh, due to COVID. 
Uh, and in July, uh, that um, order that was that was governing the moratorium was amended to allow for it to be lifted whenever the government uh, lifted the state of emergency, which we know happened um, in August. So, or sorry, it, it happened in July. So as of August 1st, all of the eviction activity um, re, uh, restarted. So hearings started resuming at the landlord tenant board, eviction orders that uh, people had and had not been able to enforce for the previous several months started to be uh, enforced in earnest. And it was really problematic because <clears throat> while the operations of the landlord tenant board resumed, they obviously had to make some significant changes to the way that they operated to accommodate for the public health guidance around things like social distancing. So uh, all sorts of changes were made, hearings were uh, being held by Zoom, and this um, caused a whole bunch of problems for uh, tenants. Um, moving online, we know, creates significant barriers for people who, who are uh, low income, who don't have access to appropriate technology, even for people who are outside of sort of core metropolitan areas that have trouble with connectivity issues. And we know that this isn't in, you know, far off parts of the province. We know that parts of, you know, Vaughan and York region don't have adequate um, internet connectivity. Uh, so when you're holding hearings that determine whether somebody's able to keep their home or not uh, over internet uh, through through um, processes like Zoom, and somebody doesn't have adequate technology to allow that to happen, it's it's deeply problematic. It should also be pointed out just as a uh, an addendum that in, in this past week, we've had numerous reports of internet shortages here in the 905, like not, not the rural parts, like the urban areas, Burlington, Oakville, Mississauga, Peel, or the highly urban areas have been reporting widespread internet outages. Um, and so I can imagine that, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things we take for granted in this country that, oh, internet, yeah, we've got access to the internet. It, in a lot of cases, it really it has turned out to be quite spotty, even in the best of urban areas in the province. And so, yeah, I can see the, the problem of trying to rely on a tribunal or a meeting that will determine if somebody is becomes homeless or not eff effectively is highly problematic to say the least. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's somewhat of a, of a, of a, a, a an economic indicator of, of someone, you know, someone, someone who's, who's about to be evicted probably isn't paying for the best internet connection anyway. Um, so they're probably going to have the slower end of things, you know, uh, plus many people don't. Yeah. The assumption that everybody has it is, is just not genuine. Uh, and this story certainly has has began to, begun to make it into the media. I know Canada Land had an episode on this, and you obviously had uh, your article um, that was published in uh, Now Magazine with, Le uh, and correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Lilani Farha, and you published on December the 15th. So it's, it's just started to sort of make itself into the media. Um, so thus far, it it's seemed to... Um, not so much actually in your article, but it's been kind of portrayed as a, as a Toronto story to an extent. Is there anything that, that actually suggests this is something that affects um, people in Toronto more than, say, the 905, or is it just the same everywhere in essence? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and no, it's definitely not a Toronto story by any stretch of the imagination. Toronto tends to get... Um, tends to get a lot of attention, uh, I think, just by virtue of the fact that it's large and, and it has a large renter population. But this is this is happening all across the province. Um, and uh, yeah, it's happening all across the province. And, and I'll just add as well, in addition to the connectivity issue, um, uh, that sort of that I that I mentioned earlier about uh, just you know the the ability to have kind of a, a straight um, or a, a functional internet connection. There are a whole bunch of other issues that uh, that are facing folks trying to navigate these procedures um, through this new um, sort of COVID environment. Uh, people are having a really hard time connecting with uh, legal counsel to be able to get um, advice on how to approach 
the uh, the hearing. We know, and and this is a this is a problem that predates. Uh, COVID for sure. Um, there was a report uh, put out uh, by one of our um, colleague organizations, the Advocacy Centre for Tenants of Ontario, not too long ago that uh, highlighted that 97% of renters facing an eviction hearing do not have legal representation or counsel, which is absolutely astonishing. That's astounding. And then in the, in the midst of, of this, um, with with in essence the uh, landlord tenant board as i understand it kind of trying to clear the backlog uh, once they came back online so kind of accelerating beyond the the, the speed they would usually work at uh, we've also had a a change in the the law at the same time so um um the government introduced bill 184 which is no longer a bill is now an act um Oh, what if you could take us through the implications of, of that and that how that might be uh, affecting the process as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, and and you're right. There is a lot happening all at the same time, and it's very challenging for tenants and and those those of whom who are lucky enough to be able to secure legal counsel uh, or support from tenant duty counsel. Uh, they're all trying to figure this out. Bill 184, uh, which is you're right, is now uh, is now in law. Um, uh, was passed back in the summer, right around the time that the eviction moratorium was lifted uh, in August. And it does uh, a number of things. I'll focus on the ones that are the, the pieces that are sort of most um, serious for renters in Ontario. The sort of first uh, big problem with, with uh, the changes are that they'll, they do allow landlords to evict their tenants without a hearing when they find themselves in financial difficulties through no fault of their own. Uh, this applies where tenants who have signed repayment agreements in previous proceedings um, uh, find themselves in financial difficulties and would like to uh, renegotiate those repayment agreements prior to Bill 184 and the changes that it brought about, the tenant had a right to a hearing to have the opportunity to renegotiate those terms. Uh, following Bill 184, that no longer happens as of right. Um, and and so uh, we hear from people in these circumstances all the time. Uh, these tend to be uh, very vulnerable people. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, a senior on a fixed income uh, who uh, ran into some trouble, uh, fell into arrears um, with uh, their rental payments. They go through the process at the landlord tenant board. They get a repayment agreement, save the tenancy, they're on a fixed income, and then something happens uh, with their sort of uh, income payments that get recalculated. And we know, particularly for folks who are on social assistance, uh, there's all sorts of ways in which recalculations are triggered and uh, are remedied down the road because there was some screw up in the system um, that triggered some sort of, uh, like I said, recalculation uh, of their monthly amount. But that could be sufficient uh, to cause somebody to go into arrears and they would not have the ability to go back uh, and renegotiate that as of right. That's one example. Another example, so, you know, the, the types of folks who would be, in, would also be in a similar circumstance um, single parents who, uh, single parents whose uh, sort of former partner, uh, is uh, paying support payments and that stops for whatever reason, that person finds themselves in a situation where they just don't have the money to um, uh, to pay their rent uh, for a period of time. And rather than being able to go back to the board and renegotiate uh, that repayment agreement, they instead just simply lose their home. So it's quite serious. Uh, and we know that those types of issues are, are gonna, those types of situations are gonna happen for the, the folks who are most vulnerable. And what, I mean, obviously not everybody who is evicted immediately ends up on the streets, um, or I guess not, otherwise it, it feels like there'd be even larger armies of people on the streets. But um, but what what is the, the prognosis isn't the right word, but what is the outcome for, for people who, who are evicted, maybe because of no fault of their own, their economic circumstances just simply changed? Well, the pro prognosis is, is not great. Uh, and what I would say is, you know, we may not see a lot of homelessness, 
but there is a lot more than people realize. There's about 235,000 Canadians every year experience homelessness. So we only see a small subset of those folks because what, what is most obvious to us are the individuals that we see sleeping rough on the streets or sleeping in parks. But there's a whole bunch of people who uh, are, uh, for example, sleeping in their cars, couch surfing, sleeping with friends and families, uh, folks in the shelter system. There's 10,000 in Toronto's shelter system alone, for example. Um, so they are they are there. Make no mistake, the the, the uh, numbers are higher than uh, than one would think. And and when I came into this work uh, for the first time, um, having not worked on the housing uh, housing policy issues uh, before joining CIRA back in October of 2018, I was astonished to understand sort of the, the scope and scale of this issue. It is unconscionable, uh, the scope and scale of this issue. For folks who are, are just more directly to your question um, about you know, what happens to, to these folks, I mean, really um, the most vulnerable individuals are will simply become homeless because when they lose their homes, they're not gonna be able to afford uh, rent at the current levels, which, you know, sorry to use a, a, a Toronto sort of uh, number, but pre-pandemic, that was $2,300 for a one, one bedroom apartment. And we know that the rents in the GTH or the, the greater, um, the greater Toronto Hamilton area, the rest of the 905 are trending in a similar pattern. And in fact, the rents in Burlington uh, are higher than the rents in Toronto. So it is a dire situation for folks in uh, in this area. And, uh, you know, at this point, their options uh, are very often to, uh, you know, find a place in the shelter system, sleep with friends and family, which is increasingly difficult to do with COVID. Uh, otherwise, we are looking at homelessness on a pretty significant scale. Um, I, I, this might be outside your, your realm of expertise, uh, Alyssa, but, you know, I, I wonder if maybe you can speak of the fact, because I've always been puzzled as to why this would, why they change the rules surrounding evictions uh and 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 tenant rights uh in the middle of this pandemic um and as somebody who who is engaged in this uh and sees the effects of this uh on the everyday person uh if you will uh like can you can you is there is there a rationale behind why would why would we do this in the middle of a global pandemic i can understand maybe the 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 tory government had this on their agenda book for a while this was a policy that they wanted to implement but like right now people the people who would be most affected by these evictions are people of precarious work or you know working in restaurants or retail that all of a sudden now that that job isn't as steady as it once was why why make it even more precarious for these people by saying yeah not only is your your employment you know on shaky ground now your 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 residency is as well and do do you know why that why this of all times we would want to mess with this system in this in this manner i think that's a great question and i think a lot of us working in this area have been scratching our heads uh to try to figure this out um you know i have a few sort of few thoughts um i know you know sort of a, a generous interpretation um and then there's sort of a less generous interpretation um, I think, uh, you know, I, I do know that the government, the provincial government has for some time had uh, an agenda for uh, modernization of the, of the justice system uh, and sort of a broad mandate to increase the use of technology. So in terms of the technological change, I know that that's been on the been on the radar for quite some time and something they've been trying to move forward with. And, you know, uh, in some circumstances, it may make sense when faced with a, a, a situation where you can't proceed with in-person proceedings to, to look to facilitate that. I think it's probably more appropriate for, say, a commercial or a corporate context, maybe, and, and certainly less appropriate for the context where we're dealing with vulnerable individuals who, for whom the, um, the outcome of the proceeding is so fundamentally life altering. Uh, so that's, you know, on the technological side, in terms of the, the substantive changes to the law, I mean, it, it's, it, that speaks to more, uh, I think a broader question of, of who government speaks to and who government understands uh, and who 
who and what interests are sort of front and center for, for uh, governments. And I don't think from what we have seen from this government that it is vulnerable tenants. It's very frustrating, obviously, that, I mean, this seems to be a part of a wider picture of, of what happened in the fall in uh, this province. What, I mean, looking at, taking this out into sort of the wider picture, obviously your work at uh, Centre for Equality Rights and Accommodation is is to do with everybody's right to accommodation and how that should work. What would the bigger picture kind of fix be? What would you like, given a, a, a willing government and, uh, uh, you know, limitless resources or whatever, uh, what do you think should happen in the province, um, A, in the short term now to deal with COVID and B, uh, in the longer term to sort of handle the, the issues with affordable housing and uh, tenants' uh, rights that we've uh, seen? That is a great question. Uh, and it's kind of a huge one. I'm sorry. <laughs> get comfortable because I have I have a probably quite a lengthy answer. And maybe maybe just to back up a step, I think it's helpful to diagnose the problem a little bit more specifically because housing is a pretty um, it's a pretty complex area, and there's lots of things that are going on uh, to uh, that have contributed to the problem. Uh, but I think, you know, from my perspective, there's a few key problems that need to be solved. One of, you know, and we got to where we are now because of, a, uh, I think, of a few primary uh, things that have happened. One in particular uh, significant disinvestment by governments in social housing uh, and um, the lack of construction of purpose-built rentals. Uh, and that's a, a problem that you both, uh, I'm sure, are aware is, has been happening over several decades. So that's one thing. Another thing is the uh, sort of on an individual level, the incentives that individual landlords have to um, move tenants along and uh, increase rents, which is something that we deal with at CIRA uh, sort of on an individual basis with, with the clients that, that reach out to us for help. And then the third uh, area is the increasing financialization of housing, which is just this uh, pernicious thing that is happening in the background that uh, many people kind of know of, but aren't really sure how and how it's impacting things. So maybe um, if you'll indulge me, I'll just say a few things uh, about each of those areas, sure. about each of those sure. um, before moving on to the, you know, what, what we can do about it. So in terms of uh, government investment in affordable housing, um, we know that the federal government uh, in particular pulled out of investing in housing in the 90s, and there's been almost no social or subsidized housing built since then. Uh, we also know uh, that when it comes to sort of where people find their rental housing options, that a significant um, majority of the large um, multi-unit buildings that have been constructed since the 90s um, have been condos and not purpose-built rentals. And that's because of, uh, you know, incentives for the folks who are building them. It's, it's better and you're going to make more money if you build a condo as opposed to a rental building. And then you don't have to deal with people, which is, uh, you know, for, for a developer or a property manager, uh, a, a plus. Um, and so it's, it's simply, you know, the, the demand is not keeping pace uh, with the need. And that is like, if you, you know, boil it down, that is what economists call a market failure. Um, it's a classic market failure in, in sort of the traditional uh, economic sense of the world. So so that's the, the sort of scope of the problem. And I think, um, you know, when we talk about um, what needs uh, what needs to be done about, about that, we need to find ways to incentivize, um, or sorry, we need to, um, we need to, uh, or governments need to get back into the business of providing funding uh, and uh, fu funding for the kinds of housing that the market isn't going to be building and also find ways to incentivize the kind of, uh, the construction of the kind of housing that the market needs. Uh, there's very few uh, areas of uh, policy areas where uh, when you see a market failure for three decades, governments fail to act. And for some reason, we're just allowing that to happen uh, over and over and over again. And it's not as though this isn't an, an issue that's important for people because every election that comes around, the issue of affordability keeps uh, making it to the top of the list. Well, we're, what costs people the most amount uh, sort of out of their pocket is their housing costs. So when we talk about affordability, that's just a shorthand for housing in many cases, right? So that's that's sort of the, 
the um, you know the the first um, major problem that needs to be solved. On an individual level, when I mentioned uh, landlords and, and sort of the incentives that they have to evict tenants, um, we hear about this all the time. We get calls from uh, people who've been in their uh, homes for 20 to 30 years, for example, they could be paying $800 a month rent uh, because rent control prevents landlords from raising rents uh, more than a certain amount from uh, year to year, uh, the, the, so long as they, you know, so so long as they're in a building that uh, uh, that qualifies. Um, and if that individual, if the, the landlord can find a way to get that person out, uh, they can reset that market rent at the current rate, which, as I mentioned, uh, at least in Toronto, was twenty three hundred dollars, and and not far behind in the rest of, of the rest of the nine hundred five. Um, there is a huge incentive to move people along. Uh, and we hear about this, like I said, all the time. We get calls from people who are one day late on their rent uh, for the first time in 10 years, and they're getting an eviction notice. Uh, so that type of behavior uh, needs to really, um, there, need, there needs to be some way of addressing that behavior because that that is not helpful for uh that's not helpful for individual tenants. It's also not helpful for the market because it just leads to a massive escalation in the in the, the price of the market. And it, this is a, a difficult question, and one if if I was still sort of involved firsthand in politics, I probably wouldn't mention because it's it's one that progressives have been as bad at handling as, as the uh, conservatives, and that there is a problem with rent control um, that. We understand why it's there, and and, and um, but it but it the conservatives are right, and so far as it does massively disincentivize building affordable housing. Um, now maybe rent control can would work if governments were also doing the investment to build um, to build affordable housing to make sure that the supply is there, but but they're not. Um, I mean, is there any country in the world? I mean, I. I I'm sure listeners are, are sick and tired of hearing me talking about how the fact they grew up in Britain and it's different there. And it's not, I, I don't raise these things because I think it's better because it's often far worse, but it's different and it's an interesting contrast. Um, Britain has massive, massive, massive supplies of municipal government built uh, housing. Um, and, you know, it, the things are still expensive there. I mean, it doesn't solve everything, but. Um, why do you think that in North America as a whole, the uh, the idea of you know building the supply that we need um, in a non-private sector way, and then renting it out? I mean, these the houses that were built in the town where I grew up in the 1950s are still being rented out year after year after year. I'm, I assume it's a kind of profitable uh, enterprise now after all that time that the municipal government is basically a landlord um, with a very large supply of, of, of stock. Um, wh why have we so been so reluctant to, to go down that road here? That's a great question. Um, that's a really great question. I mean, I think, I think part, part of it is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing sort of the, the legacy, uh, you know, as, as strange as it seem as strange as it may seem to say, because it it's was quite some time ago, but I think we're still seeing the legacy of, of the sort of Thatcher Reagan, uh, approach to social policy playing out here. And, um, you know, we've, uh, we had a particular approach of dealing with housing until the nineties. Uh, and then a switch was, was flicked. Uh, and, and that hasn't been revisited in a serious way since that time. I will say, um, uh, with the, uh, a very important caveat that we now have, um, as of a, a few years ago, a national housing strategy. And as of, uh, last uh, June 2019, a National Housing Strategy Act that gets the federal government back into housing in uh, a big way and in a way that it hasn't been involved in 30 years. So uh, I'm a bit of an optimist. Uh, some may call me naive, but I'm 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 an optimist because I have to be. 
<laughs> when you work in, in politics and deal with, with issues like these. I think that this is a game changer. And I think that this is the start of revisiting this policy failure that has happened for decades. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've talked about sort of our involvement in, in politics to this point. I will say that it was it was the Liberals who, uh, you know, in government in the 90s that made that decision. Um, so, you know, nobody has clean hands on this. You know, we're all, mm -hmm. we're all, we all bear the responsibility of those decisions that have had very significant implications on people's lives. What's really exciting to me about the um, National Housing Strategy Act uh, and this probably won't come as a surprise to either of you because we've, we've talked about this, um, is the fact that it's grounded in human rights and it's it starts off by recognizing and committing to progressively implement the right to housing, which really turns a lot of this conversation on its head because when you talk about something as a matter of policy, uh, it becomes a thing that, um, how do I say this? Uh, when something's a policy, it's it's kind of a nice to have, uh, and governments can sort of make decisions on it the way that they make decisions on anything else. When you recognize something as a human right, it fundamentally changes the way that we talk about that thing. Uh, it is elevated to a level of importance, which means you can't just turn it off and on whenever you feel like it. You can't just pay attention to it when it's convenient for you, uh, and you can't just sort of cut it out of the budget because you're trying to uh, get to balance. Um, governments toy with and mess around with human rights at their peril. Uh, and as the sort of sector that I work in becomes increasingly um, aware of and has the capacity to understand and frame the work that we're doing in the context of human rights, this culture of housing as a human rights, uh, I see it sort of firsthand with the work that I'm doing is growing and people understand it. People understand that housing is a human right because they know how important it is to them and they get it. It's very intuitive. Um, I, I, I wanted to, to kind of take that note and kind of bring the conversation uh, back a bit. Um, Cause we're, right now we're in a, we're still in this pandemic. Um, there are a lot of people who are, uh, I don't know. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but a lot of people are currently unemployed or they're underemployed, and they're 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 in very precarious uh, financial situations. Um, and the ability now to go in and I, I know I know the the province has, has implemented a, a moratorium once again on evictions, but in my mind, as we've kind of discussed, it's just pushing the problem down the road. At one point, those people have to go back to a landlord tenant tribunal and plead for them to stay or renegotiate or whatever and they very well may be evicted from their homes which if you as we've discussed there could be a tsunami of homelessness coming our way in 2021 or post covid um whenever we're out of this mess and i bring this up because everyone's talking about oh the economic recovery you know we need we need we need to, the, the the economy to come back and whatnot and autonomy as we were discussing, how hard is it for an economic recovery when you have such a huge number of people who are potentially homeless? I mean, how, how are those people able to re-engage into the economy in a meaningful way, not just, you know, paycheck to paycheck, but somebody who has an education, a background, a diploma, degree, whatever, to now go back in and say, oh, well, I want to start up a business. I want to, I want to be able to be hired Yet you don't you have no permanent fixed address to put on the job application, and you know I I, I just I I find this is all connected. It's it's not uh, you know this problem is happening over here and evictions are happening over here. I find that they're very much connected if we want to come out stronger post COVID nineteen. Uh, maybe maybe you want to touch on that in your experience with uh, with the issue, Alyssa. Yeah, absolutely. Another great question. And, you know, the the specific question of, you know, how, to what extent is a an economic recovery possible where such a significant portion of the population is facing housing precarity? I, I mean, I think the answer is it's impossible. Um, we know that people can't succeed without homes. Um, uh, and that, you know, that exists for everyone um, without exception, right? I mean, without a stable home, you your health outcomes are worse, your employment outcomes are worse. 
um, your mental health suffers. Uh, it is a it is a real and significant problem for for everyone, and and of course it affects different people differently, based on you know to your point, uh, sort of folks who are uh, recent grads who are sort of looking to get into the job market versus you know, the individual who is uh, sleeping rough on the street or or in a in a tent uh, in, in the local park. Um, the um, but they they, uh, you know, it may not seem this way, but they are facing very similar circumstances in, in terms of in terms of housing precarity. And so we run the risk of having this um, very um, significant social problem affecting people right across a demo, like a, a range of demographics uh, in a way that we haven't really seen before. Um, I think governments would be, um, you know, take, switching from sort of the housing, housing as a human right um, angle and just sort of talking, uh, you know, about this as a matter of pure policy. I think governments would be wise to keep in mind the importance of housing when they when they look at a recovery because it is not going to be possible um it, it's not unlike sort of uh, some of the conversations that uh, are happening with respect to child care there is a whole swath of the population who are not going to be able to get back to work if they don't have uh if they don't have the ability to have child care uh and it's no different with it's no different with housing at all so i think it's important to look at these things holistically I uh, I sincerely hope that that is the way that this is going to be viewed. Um, you touched on, you, you made another comment um, as well, sort of earlier in your remarks that I just want to respond to as well, which is kicking the can down the road. Um, you know, whether this kicks the can down the road, um, you know, the current eviction moratorium. And I should, um, I should actually uh, just flag as well, because I don't think, know that I said this at the beginning, but, um, as of yesterday, the moratorium on uh, the enforcement of eviction orders was reinstated. Uh, so as of uh, as of at least yesterday at uh, you know 6 p.m., which is when I understand um, it took effect. So that would be January 13th uh, at 6 p.m. No residential eviction orders will be enforced uh, for the duration of the uh, emergency order. So that helps people in the immediate term. But you're absolutely right; it kicks kicks the can down the road. People who don't have an income right now are still unable to pay their rent, and they are uh, simply accumulating arrears. Uh, and unable to um, clear those arrears to be able to stay in their homes. That is a very significant problem. Uh, and uh, without some kind of an intervention by government, there will be a tsunami of evictions when this is all over. Uh, and uh, it will bring all of the sort of pernicious um, implications. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I cannot imagine what our province and region would look like with uh, evictions of the scale that we are looking at, but it is terrifying. And, and my, my, you know, this may be my, my bias is speaking, but I don't think it is, <laughs> you know, again and again and again, you feel with things like this, uh, which fair enough, you know, this is not a, a monopoly of conservative governments. Um, like you said, this whole thing began with a liberal government. Um, the end up if you if you're doing it purely on the basis of cost and what the government has to pay to keep people healthy this is the more expensive road to go because like you say mental health uh, drug addiction uh, you know, all these things that go along with with people living in desperate circumstances are so expensive to deal with um uh, and we could avoid all of that um with with sure a little bit of expense now um and maybe a substantial amount of expense now but it will be less substantial than what we're paying down the road um so it, it it's it's frustrating and you feel i mean i i've said this i don't know how many times now um you know the sort of hope that we come out of this this um period in our history kind of with the same attitude as we had at the end of the second world war was like okay you know home fit for heroes um we're gonna build a sort of brave new world that is better than what we had before uh, after this cataclysm that we just that we went through uh i i have my doubts that it will happen but it'd be nice. <laughs> i'd really like to see you know fundamental changes and 
thinking about things like you know basic there's basic income there's you know we, we did an episode on basic income uh, a few months ago yep. and it relates so much to what we've been talking about today and that you um the uh jesse uh Golem. joel Huff, jesse Golem. Golem and, and deidre pike were yeah so Jess, jesse was uh on the basic income pilot in hamilton and she spoke about how it just fundamentally changed her outlook on what was possible in life and then of course when it was taken away again um you know she's back to working to exist rather than working to live with a very talented person with all kinds of uh uh, uh skills and talents that she hoped to be at but all the time she was you know subsistent you know working as a waitress or whatever she was kind of stuck in this uh, cycle um this is the same thing that all the time uh people are um dealing with accommodation and so on um they're stuck where they don't need to be where they these are people with talent and capability who could be uh contributing uh to the economy who are uh who are not uh, as usual, I, I've just said something that doesn't end with a question mark, but <laughs> feel free to comment <laughs> on, on that. I, I think you're absolutely right, Roland. And I think, I mean, I, I sort of, I think we're at a bit of a crossroads to sort of, you know, add to what you're saying. I think, I think we're, we have options at this point, like we have options in terms of what does a, um, what does rebuilding look like uh, after something uh, after something uh, as significant as a global pandemic and what it's done to our economy? And we have choices in front of us. And I think, you know, we can choose to rebuild what we had, um, which was, um, you know, a system that for the most part relied on people to take care of themselves. And if they made it great, and if not, we would sort of throw them a few crumbs and call it a day or we can uh, build something that allows people to be the best versions of themselves and enables them and we all end up better and we win in the end. And I think that that's a really obvious and easy choice to make. And I really hope that that's what we're looking at at the end of this, because I think we, I think we fail and continue to fail to solve these problems at our peril. There's so much wasted talent. There's so much wasted opportunity. Um, and for what ideology, because we think that people should be able to figure it out on their own, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Well, I think it's, it comes down to where do we put our priorities, uh, in terms of our, our society? Do we, you know, I think we're learning that there are certain basic needs that we, we really ought to, uh, really ought to be taken care of. And when we, we're, I think that this pandemic is I kind of said that from the beginning, this pandemic has kind of magnified all these inequalities and all these problems that we've had over the years and that we're now dealing with it. We realize people shouldn't be spending their energies wondering how they're going to live day to day. They shouldn't be wondering how, how do they put food on the table and are they still going to have a roof over their heads um, tomorrow? That it doesn't, that doesn't, if we want to have a thriving, prosperous, productive economy and society that's not where that's not the lesson we should be taking away from people um uh, or get or telling telling our children i i hope that this that COVID 19 has kind of made us check that and maybe made us to re-examine re and reevaluate and say what can we do um and more importantly what ought we do uh to help each other out well, I would going to close off the episode uh, with that, and I'd like to thank you, Alyssa, for coming on and joining us uh, today out of your busy schedule. And hopefully, we can have you on at some point in a future episode, and hopefully, we'll have better news to share. <laughs> yeah, and and perhaps we'll uh, we'll look forward, Alyssa, to maybe seeing you in person sometime in the future as well. <laughs> All of those would be wonderful. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode of the 905er. Thank you for listening. As always, you can send us your feedback, thoughts, and concerns, or ideas for future episodes to our email, info at 905er.ca. We'd love to hear from you. You can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through Patreon as well as PayPal. Visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab. As well, links are in the show notes for your convenience. 
Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time. to make the most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness then check out the natural man podcast join me host mike c as we explore all areas of human wellness physical mental and emotional learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health remember your doctor works for you learn biohacks neurohacks ways to improve sleep and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.